and Pete Hegseth. Yesterday, we told you roughly some 54 million people had already mm -hmm. voted in this country. Make that 54 million and one. President Trump voted yesterday live here right after Fox and Friends. And reports are he voted for a man named <laughs> Trump, Jedediah. Reports. That's very shocking. <laughs> Uh, and, and yeah, no, I mean, it, I think also the just to say like the enthusiasm, I, I went into Manhattan yesterday for an appointment and the vo the lines for voting were wrapped around the block. So I think the enthusiasm, there's going to be a lot of people showing up in the next nine days on both sides of the aisle. I think the enthusiasm is pretty high um, and, and it was just stunning to see. I have never seen that uh, in all of my years of voting, ha what I saw yesterday. So it was it was it was a moment. Small correction, it's 56 million and one. Oh, wow. It's, it, that's a couple million votes overnight uh, yeah. banked in. I asked you guys, since New York is early voting, whether you were going to vote tomorrow. Have you voted yet? It I'm could not be yet. 56 million and three. No? I'm not yet. Not yet. Okay, too bad. Not yet. All right, we're going to keep a tracker on Will and Jed and their voting status. I have, I have, I have no <laughs> doubts that uh, with nine days to go, they'll make it. Uh, but we're glad you're joining us this morning. Really appreciate it. And it was one of those, and I've said it before, but it's worth sort of appreciating. It was one of those cable news, news days where you turn on the TV and Donald Trump was in a different state. Every time you looked up, the backdrop looked more or less the same. Did you see the rally in the middle of the day? I think it was the one in Ohio. Where, there, right there. The two nuns were flanking him. I looked up at my wife and I said, he's got the MAGA nuns. <laughs> there they are. Uh, that, that's the one in Ohio, I guess. Uh, that was the one in the middle of the day. And it was uh, Joe Biden did leave his basement briefly to go to Pennsylvania, uh, which was just a few miles from his house. So a quick little drive while the president crisscrossed the country, as we mentioned, North Carolina, Ohio and Wisconsin. Here's a portion uh, of what President Trump said yesterday. It's great to be in Lumberton. We're going to win the state of North Carolina. And we're going to win four more years in the White House. I fight for the middle class, and Biden and his cronies serve only one class. They serve the donor class. Hello, Circleville. It's great to be back in Ohio to celebrate the return of Big Ten football. Sleepy Joe said, President Trump didn't want to have football. I said, what the hell is he talking about? Hello, Wisconsin. The people of Wisconsin must stop these anti-American radicals by giving Joe Biden a thundering defeat. If we win, Wisconsin wins. If we win, America wins. Address this with the Biden folks. Kamala Harris was caught on a hot mic moment saying, are, are we in Cleveland? Oh, oh, we are. OK, hello, Cleveland. Uh, and it's not like they're making all these stops across the country. I will also say watching uh, Barack Obama a campaign yesterday and Joe Biden, it felt like the hats uh, and the humans versus the honking horns. It's like the MAGA versus the Mazdas or the people versus the Priuses. I mean, the, the whole idea of these huge rallies of people swarming saying we want to be open with the economy versus the sort of the very different approach that, that Biden is taking. And we have a lot of that coming up a little bit later in the show today, including how Joe Biden responded to some of that honking. But here's what you can expect for the coming days. For President Trump, it's seven events in three days, including a busy Tuesday where he'll be in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Nebraska. Meanwhile, as Pete mentioned, Joe Biden has taken the day off today. He is um, at home in Delaware. He will deliver some virtual marks at an I Will Vote virtual concert, which I believe is going to feature Bon Jovi and Cher. Mm -hmm. On Tuesday, he does get out. Um, he is going to Georgia, Warm Springs, Georgia, and Atlanta, Georgia, is Joe Biden. This says two things in my mind, or, Jedediah, I think we can read into this two things. It seems to indicate, I would think, some confidence on Joe Biden's part. I mean, or if you're ready yeah. to run the clock out, you usually run the clock out when you are leading on the scoreboard. So it would indicate they feel somewhat confident. Mm -hmm. Also, Pete, as you pointed out this morning, going to Georgia... Is 16, that didn't go so well, that strategy. Who knows, though? Maybe this time it will. I think there is one risk, though, of being out front and center so much. Um, and, and maybe the Biden campaign is factoring that in. I don't know. And the challenge is, it's really a challenge. This late in the game, oftentimes you have to make a decision. Do you want to rally the base 
or do you want to sway those undecideds? And the technique that you use, the language you use, the rhetoric, the topics you talk about often are very different from, from each other, meaning what you would say in a rally and what you would say in a debate format might be very different. So the risk for, for the Trump campaign potentially would be, am I going to marginalize those undecideds by some of the content in the rallies? And you can, you can very easily see that by the contrast in his approach in that last debate, which I think was set up in a way that he very much could sway undecideds his way. And then what you see in a rally like yesterday, where some of that language, particularly with respect to COVID-19, might marginalize those undecideds. That may be a decision that the Biden camp has made where they're saying, listen, maybe the less we say right now, the better, the easier, the less likely to marginalize. Let's just sit back, let Trump do the talking, hope for the best. And as of right now, they are leading in the polls. So who knows? That strategy might completely backfire, uh, but but the next nine days are going to show us for sure. Yeah, it's going to be the bum rush versus the basement. To think nine days out and you have nothing on your campaign schedule except a Zoom call with celebrities at, I think it's 8 p.m. tonight, is what Joe Biden has. And and if, you're, if, if the idea is to attempt to sway undecided voters, that's such a small fraction right now. Ultimately, you need to motivate your people. And Bernie Sanders is out there not ruling out a 2024 primary challenge and saying he has his own 100-day plan as a socialist at the beginning of a Biden administration. This is not in the bag for him at all. No, you know what? I want to say this about this confidence concept as well. There's a difference between confidence and irrational confidence. We don't know yeah. yet which one is Joe Biden's. It's like a shooter in the corner waving his hand. I'm open. I'm open. But the problem is in 2016, <laughs> that same shooter missed that shot. So although it's Clinton to Biden, that kind of confidence can either be irrational or earned. We'll wait and see with nine days to go which kind of confidence. You can't always know whether you're passing to Steve Kerr or not. That's right. You know, maybe you are, maybe right. you're not. Will he hit the shot? Great point. Uh, but we've got another topic. The crazy part about this moment is that it comes alongside a Senate confirmation of, a, of an ex-Supreme Court justice in Amy Coney Barrett. And if you remember, at the beginning of the process, there was some uncertainty because Republican senators were coming out and saying, the squish is especially like Alaska Senator Lisa Murkowski saying, well, we, maybe this is a little too soon. Maybe we shouldn't hold the vote. Well, Lisa from Alaska has decided, even though she didn't like the process at the beginning, she will be voting for Amy Coney Barrett. Here's what she said. I believe that the only way to put us back on the path of appropriate consideration of judicial nominees is to evaluate Judge Barrett as we would want to be judged on the merits of her qualifications. And we do that when that final question comes before us. And when it does, I will be a yes. Yeah, and she she will be confirmed, and she is a fantastic choice. I mean, anyone who watched that hearing and didn't walk away with immense respect for not only her accomplishments, but her ability to articulate her uh, positions and to not let her own opinions get in the way and really do the job that we should want any Supreme Court justice to do, which is to uh, look at the law and not let her own perspective on things come into play in any way. Um, that, that's truly the person that she is. And um, we've had the pleasure of speaking with people who have known her for years, um, who have attested to her character as well. So this is a fantastic choice uh, who, who should be confirmed. Now, Senator Chuck Schumer wasted no time stepping in and, and giving his commentary on Mitch McConnell in particular. Take a listen to what he had to say. I just heard the Republican leader say there is no inconsistency between what Republicans are doing now with Amy Coney Barrett's nomination and what they did with Merrick Garland in 2016. Who would believe that? The contradiction is glaring. The contradiction will be a stain on the leader's forehead and on the entire Republican caucus if it continues. I'm generally familiar with the phrase, a stain on your record. A stain on your forehead is a new one that. to me, yeah, that is a new one. but it is, it is evocative. Um, I will say this. Um, the great question is, how many people will vote for President Trump in 2020, I believe, who didn't vote for President Trump in 2016? Pete, you mentioned undecided voters left in the process. We're going to be speaking to several undecided voters this morning on Fox & Friends, which will be a fascinating conversation. But for many tentative or shy conservatives in 2016, the reason to vote for President Trump was this, was conservative justices on the Supreme Court. And Senator Lindsey Graham is saying, if that was your litmus test, it has been an absolute success. Listen. 
She's not going to impose the law of Amy on the rest of us. She'll apply the law to the facts. We have the votes. I think she'll be on the court early next week. And this is one of the most significant accomplishments for President Trump, a constitutional conservative on the court. This makes three. This is why we're in this business. This is why we work so hard. This is why we put up with all the BS for moments like this. This is a very big deal, America. Yes. Thank you, President Trump. Guys, I love admitting when I'm wonderfully wrong. And I remember when this process started, when, when, when RBG passed and there was a talk of, a, I said, this is going to make Kavanaugh look like a uh, touch football. And it didn't because ultimately she was bulletproof, Jed, as you talked about, and the Republicans handled the process very, very well. And here we are. I mean, it could have right. been something far nastier and worse. Instead, she will be a justice come Monday night. Right. The process yeah. went smoothly. Yeah, um, it was fairly cordial, mm -hmm. and it's three Supreme Court justices in one term for President Trump, which for many voters was the exact it's a big reason. Deal. That's right. It's a really big deal. All right. Turning now to your headlines. Five top aides for Vice President Pence test positive for COVID-19. Among them, Chief of Staff Mark Short and political advisor Marty Obst. Both are in quarantine. The New York Times reporting three other VP staffers have tested positive. Vice President Pence and the second lady tested negative for the virus yesterday. And country music world, the country music world, the Texas country music world is mourning the loss of a legendary singer-songwriter, Jerry Jeff Walker. Instead of dancing now at every chance in the honky tonk. Drinks and chips. I've been wanting to introduce Pete and Jedediah to music like this. Every Texan can sing the words by heart. Jerry Jeff Walker passed away after a battle with throat cancer. He's best known for writing the hit song, Mr. Bojangles, and tributes are pouring in online. Singer Margot Price tweeting, blasting Jerry Jeff Walker records while cooking dinner tonight. Ride high, wild one. And the Paramount Theater in Austin, Texas, posting a picture of its marquee reading, farewell to our tried and true friend, Jerry Jeff Walker. He was 78 years old. Turning to sports, the Tampa Bay Rays winning game four of the World Series on a wild final. And those are your morning's headlines. I had not seen that yet. So they had them in a rundown. That's the first time seeing. See, we go to bed pretty early. <laughs> yeah, here. we do. <laughs> so that's the first time seeing them too. Had them in a rundown and instead <laughs> yeah. he bobbled it and scored. Right. Wow. Good for the Rays. It'll be a series. Baseball is, baseball games are very, very long and the scores are very tiny. It's like I could be sitting there, have it on in the background for five hours, and then it's like 1-0. How is that even a thing? Last All right, night was exciting, though. Coming up, it's one fun. of the few <laughs> pollsters who predicted Trump's victory in 2016 is betting he will win again, and he has the data to back it up. So why do so many other polls show Biden leading in some states? He's going to... Strong polls in Trafalgar. He's, he's one, he called it very accurately last time that we're two points up in Michigan in the Trafalgar poll, which has been a very accurate poll. President Trump touting the latest polls of our first guest this morning, one of the only pollsters who accurately predicted the 2016 election. Now he says the president is on track to win re-election, thanks to the help of what they call shy Trump supporters. Robert Cahaley is the chief pollster for the Trafalgar Group. He joins me now. Robert, thank you so much for being here. So what are you doing, or what did you do in 2016, and what are you doing this year that other pollsters are not doing that make your polls accurate? Well, we are employing methods as what's called the shy uh, Trump effect or the uh, social desirability. And that's people's unwillingness to express an opinion that they think will make them look uh, in some light to the person asking the question that's not favorable. And uh, it's in our uh, way we do it with ensuring a little more anonymity, and we use a mix of all kinds of digital platforms, as well as quick questions for people to participate are some of the keys in doing that. Shorter poll questions so people don't have to hang on the line as long, larger sample sizes, yet the, uh, the, the sort of mainstream pollsters dismiss what you do, yet, yet they get it wrong. Uh, do they know that they're missing these voters that you're talking about? <laughs> you know, I don't know the answer to that. It seems rather strange to me that they haven't learned any lessons. And they say they corrected things, some nonsense about adjusting their sample for education waiting. But yet, when we had the again in place in Florida in the uh, Gillum DeSantis race last year, or excuse me, 2018, 
they were all wrong again, and we were the only ones right again there, too. Yeah, the, the governor's race in Florida. Let's take one state in particular, in Michigan. This is where the Tavalga Group has the race. It has the president up 1%. Uh, Real Clear Politics, which is the, the famous aggregator, has the, the president down eight points. I mean, that's a nine-point gap. Uh, you also have a strong Senate candidate there in John James. Um, when, you, when you look at a race like that in particular, um, are you confident that the president's ahead there right now? You know, I really am. I look at three factors. One, uh, there's a lot of folks who are absolutely uh, enthralled with John James as a candidate. Uh, he, he is also kind of uh, coming in as an outsider, which, make his, which makes his message mesh very well with is giving some strength uh, to the ticket. Also, we can't, there's no one that uh, Trump can be more appreciative of than Gretchen Whitmer because she is single handedly uh, created an environment where people in Michigan are to business, and that's also an advantage for the president there. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, key contrasts there in Michigan. Listen, I, I, for one, hope hope your polling is correct, and I think people should be paying a lot of attention to it as opposed to dismissing it. Robert Cahaley, thank you so much for being here this morning. Uh, pay attention to those polls. Trafalgar Group, if you want to get a real sense of where this race is right now. All right, still ahead, the Senate is expected to vote tomorrow to confirm Judge Amy Coney Barrett. The Senate is expected to vote on Judge Amy Coney Barrett's Supreme Court confirmation tomorrow. And while Democrats have warned she'll be a threat to women's rights, our next guest argues that, quote, Barrett is a beacon for a new kind of feminism in America. Here with more is the executive director of Heritage, Heritage Action for America, Jessica Anderson. Jessica, so that's your op-ed that we referenced. Welcome to the show. Good morning to you. Um, so what, what did you mean by that, a new kind of feminism? Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. So... Judge Barrett's potential ascension to the Supreme Court, I think, represents this new wave of, of uh, feminist role models for women everywhere. For decades, feminists have told us that you have to choose between having a job and a career or having a family, or you have to put off having a family, get your abortion, wait 15 years, whatever that might be, and then you can you know, pursue your career. Judge Barrett represents that you can do both. You can have a loving family and a professional career that has the potential to be, you know, the highest, um, the highest judicial route you could take on the Supreme Court. So it's very exciting to see her move through this process. Yeah, you know, I have immense respect for her ability to juggle all of those responsibilities. I have one 11-month-old and a job, and it's a challenge. Yes, <laughs> so I know. more power I... to her. But, yes. As a mother, I'm a mother of two yeah, young children. Ultimately, and... though, yeah, exactly. I know. And I, I feel like everyone at home, I, I was speaking to a lot of friends of mine who also are parents and saying, how does she do it? How does she do it? So that's a testament to, to her. Absolutely. One thing, though, that I think with this particular uh, nomination and likely confirmation is that this is a win to me for Americans, because this seems to be a woman who she, she really wants to sit there and interpret the law and stick to that. That is what a Supreme Court justice is supposed to do. So this seems like someone who really understands the role that she's supposed to play and wants to play it. That's exactly what her testimony this last week and a half really showed. She was pressed amongst the corner multiple times to take a policy position on a forthcoming case. And she said, no, look, I'm going to be known as someone that is going to be a textualist, an originalist, interpreting the law. I don't have a policy agenda. I didn't wake up this morning to pursue something. That's the job of Congress. It's not the job of the courts. And really, it's for that reason that she becomes such a great role model, not just for women, but for Americans across the country, to see the original intent of the court return to that and really return to its fundamental role as one of the three branches of government. Jessica, were you surprised by the civility uh, in the hearing? Uh, there was a lot of talk about, oh, this could be a repeat of Kavanaugh. I was really impressed by people on both sides of the aisle that were questioning her. There seemed to be a lot of decency in the room, a lot of civility. Tough questions, yes, but it was not a repeat of Kavanaugh. Did that surprise you? 
Well, I was thankful that it wasn't a repeat of Kavanaugh and that they didn't go on this on this smear and character campaign. There was some of that. You saw some of the liberal media. You definitely saw some blue check marks on Twitter that were instigating her, talking about her faith, her family. How could she have that many children and still keep up with her duties? So there, there was some charactering. But mainly you saw the Democrats in the Senate judiciary use their time to advance a, a policy agenda and get those 30 seconds of a YouTube clip for their own campaigns. I mean, I think that was really more of how they used the time as opposed to going down a smear tactic that they did with Kavanaugh. So in, in that way, I was relieved. I was also encouraged by how strong and steadfast she was. She had such a command of her um, previous hearings, her legal career. And, and that really shined through the entire hearing process and was exemplary. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Uh, deeply, deeply impressive woman. Um, Jessica Anderson with a unique perspective on feminism. Everyone should check that out in The Hill. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Coming up, Joe Biden campaign in Pennsylvania happening just days after calling for an end to the oil industry. So how do voters in the battle... ...are doing the Trump guys. It's about decency. I'll work as hard for those who don't support me as those who do, including those chumps with the microphone out there. <laughs> Look, that's the job of a president. Kind of hard to claim decency while simultaneously calling people chumps. <laughs> it's also kind of hard to say you're going to represent blue states and red states, but yet again, call your opponents chumps. Let's talk about it with Sean Parnell, GOP congressional candidate <laughs> for Pennsylvania, retired Army infantry captain. Sean, uh, good to see you this morning. I do want to ask you this question, though, because I can hear the rebuttal. I can hear, well, President Trump is aggressive with his opponents. He's had people thrown out of his rallies. He's gone after NFL players. He's aggressive as well with his opponents. So what makes what Joe Biden's saying different than President Trump's aggressiveness? Well, I mean, this is a disturbing pattern with radical leftists who, who run for president. Under, with Barack Obama, people in Pennsylvania were simpletons who clung to Bibles and, and guns and religion. Uh, under Hillary Clinton, we were deplorables, and now under Joe Biden, uh, we're chumps. So in the span of a week, Joe Biden said, I'm a proud Democrat, but I'm, I'm going to run as an American president, and then comes to my home state of Pennsylvania and calls people that don't support him chumps. So uh, look, uh, th this, is, this is quintessential Joe Biden, says one thing but does another, uh, and I think the people of Pennsylvania ultimately will reject it. Sean, one of the key issues that has emerged that will have a deep impact on voters in Pennsylvania and other states, for that matter, is the issue of the oil and gas industry and fracking. So let's get a reminder of while campaigning in Pennsylvania, Joe Biden says he won't ban fracking. Let's listen to that first. I will not ban fracking, period. I'll protect Pennsylvania jobs, period. No matter how many times Donald Trump says it. Unlike Donald Trump, I don't think big oil companies need a handout of federal government. We're going to get rid of the $40 billion fossil fuel subsidies, and we're going to invest it in clean energy and carbon capture. He's obviously been terribly inconsistent on this issue. Even SNL couldn't help themselves in pointing it out. Let's watch that now. As promised, I have saved exactly 60 seconds for climate change, Mr. Vice President. Well, since we're almost out of time, oil, no, wind, yes, fracking, depends on what state I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> True. So, but Sean, seriously, how important is this? And at this late stage of the game, could this make a difference? Oh, it absolutely can make a difference because people in Pennsylvania remember under eight years with Barack Obama and Joe Biden, this state lost over 50,000 manufacturing oil and gas jobs. Joe Biden has systematically waged war on the American worker for 47 years in Washington, whether it's, whether it's disastrous deals like NAFTA or TPP. Uh, people in Pennsylvania remember uh, what it was like under those economic policies and three years under, under President Trump. He's brought back all of those jobs, plus a net 13,000 uh, manufacturing steel and oil and gas jobs. So people in Pennsylvania will remember. Uh, and I'm telling you, that comment about oil uh, will hurt him on Election Day in Pennsylvania. Sean, we're talking about Election Day, but it's, it's really an election season right now. And a lot of people are concerned about voter sure. integrity. When, we, when you look at the race, it turns out Pennsylvania is that swing state. Your district, Pennsylvania 17, is the swing district inside the swing state. What happens in your race 
ripples across the country. And something, uh, the, the Pennsylvania Board of Elections has acknowledged that they sent erroneously out nearly 29,000 ballots, meaning they sent the wrong ballots to the wrong district. And now you're in a fight to prevent ballots sent to the wrong district from being counted for the wrong candidates. Uh, it sounds like a mess. Can you explain what's going on there? It, it, look, it, it is absolutely a mess. The Allegheny County Board of Education admits that, or Board of Board of uh, Election admits that it sent out 30,000 ballots to the wrong people and to the wrong districts, in some cases with the wrong candidate's name on it. In order to rectify that, they sent out 30,000 more. And what I'm asking is that those ballots be separated to ensure that people vote, vote one time and for the candidates that actually represent them. Opponent is advocating for the opposite, that they not be separated at all. So if that's the case, how do we ensure that people aren't voting twice and for candidates that actually represent them? What Connor Lamb wants, what my opponents wants, is for people outside of the district to vote here in my district. So why should people in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, have a say over who represents Beaver County? Connor Lamb is a lawyer. He's a federal prosecutor. He should know better. And, and what I want is just to protect the, the integrity of our elections and to make sure that in Pennsylvania we have free and fair elections. And if Connor Lamb has his way, uh, we won't have that at, at all. Sean, you, have, you mentioned lawyers. I mean, we, lawyers have descended on your di district. Mark Elias, uh, DCCC, Democrat lawyers, they've, they've filed multiple filings to prevent that separation, which means effectively everything goes into the same pile and you can't siphon out whether someone's voted twice or even in the right district. And for you, it's a concern because the district next to you, Pennsylvania 18, is a heavily Democrat district. If those votes pour into yours, it changes the entire race and the whole state. Absolutely. And so at the core of this lawsuit is, you know, what Connor Lamb is trying to do. And look, don't believe, don't believe me. Look what he says. He says right here, your vote shouldn't go into a separate pile or be counted differently because of a contractor's mistake. What he's saying is he wants people from outside the district to vote in our district. And, and look, it's actually worse and more complicated than what you said, Pete, because ballots from PA 18 also came into PA 17. It's an absolute mess. And all I'm trying to do is bring a level of order uh, to the chaos that a problem that look, this is a problem that Democrats from the go from Governor Wolf on down have created. And I'm trying to make sure uh, that my constituents and the people of Pennsylvania, that their votes count and their votes matter. Uh, and, and it's absolute chaos here. So we're in the thick of it. Uh, look, and if you're watching right, if you're watching right now, please go to my website, seanforcongress.co, and help me win this election and help me fight this fight. P, you point out the way Sean's district goes, it's a swing district, could be an indicator for the entire nation. Let's hope this kind of mess, this kind of chaos and lack of order is also not indicative of a mess in mail-in balloting across this nation. Yeah. Uh, we, we should note, by the way, we invited Sean's opponent, Congressman Connor Lamb, to appear for an interview, and we haven't heard, yet heard back just yet. All right, Sean, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. All right. We're going to turn to some headlines for you now. Crews wipe out the first nest of murder hornets found in the U.S. Workers wore heavy-duty protective gear to destroy the nest in Washington state. They filled the tree up with foam, then covered it in plastic wrap. They then inserted a tube to suck up the potentially deadly hornets, collecting them for testing. Officials say the nest was the size of a basketball, with about 200 hornets inside. Woo, that's rough. A Texas deputy is hailed a hero for saving a choking baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. You have to do it, baby. Please, please, please. Mm. Terrifying. Deputy Adam Dodson performing life-saving measures on the baby boy after he became unconscious. Body camera video capturing the tense moments in College Station. Finally, after one extremely long minute, the baby starts breathing on his own again, thankfully. And an aggressive turkey is no longer terrorizing the streets of Oakland, California. A wildlife trapper disguising himself as an older lady helped capture Gerald. The bird was known for frequently targeting elderly women, forcing the city to close a popular garden. The wildlife group is working to find a more suitable home for Gerald. It's not clear what was causing his anger. And those are your headlines. Maybe it is being caged that Gerald should go to Farm Sanctuary. Farm Sanctuary people, if you're listening, take Gerald. I'll be greatly appreciative. Or he can go to Adam Klotz. Adam, are you, uh, what do you think? You up for a bird? Uh, Thanksgiving's coming up, so I'm Bingo. getting close to that time. 
<laughs> exactly. Thanks, Pete. I knew I knew you'd like it. I love it. Uh, you know what? Uh, thinking of Thanksgiving temperatures, we're stepping all over each other right now. Okay, I'm going to do the weather, and then we can talk about that. Tropical storm Zeta now spinning off the coast of Mexico. Uh, we're going to see possibly another hurricane as we're still moving through hurricane season, even though we're getting closer and closer to some winter-like temperatures across the middle of the country. Currently a tropical storm. This is going to run up into the Gulf of Mexico. The water still warm, climbing up to a Category 1 hurricane. What are we talking about for an arrival with this potential system? Well, these are all of our tropical models, still a little bit early, so there's time for this to shift a little off toward the west, a little off towards the east. But you're seeing a lot of these running up again to an area that's just been battered, Louisiana stretching over to the uh, Florida panhandle. Otherwise, what's happening across the country? Well, it's feeling more and more like winter. These are some of the current temperatures out there getting down into the teens, into the 20s, feeling like Thanksgiving. As I toss it back out there, I'm starting to get hungry now that we're talking about turkey. Guys. Thanks, Adam. Adam for the win. Thank you. Yep. All right, coming up, Disneyland may be taking California's governor to court over COVID-19 lockdowns. Up next, hear from a laid-off employee who's fighting to get the park back in business so that she can get back to work, which is what people want to do. And all those fine folks that's collecting data about how the company targets users for political ads. The NYU Ad Observatory has gotten information on more than 200,000 ads. Facebook says the collection of bulk data is against its rules and is threatening additional enforcement action if the project is not stopped and data deleted by November 30th. Only they get the info. And a group of Uber drivers is suing the company for bullying. Uber is accused of coercing workers to support California Proposition 22. The law, in the, uh, the law in the ballot classifies drivers as independent contractors instead of employees. Uber tells Fox Business most drivers support Prop 22. Will, over to you. All right, thanks, Pete. A group that represents California's largest theme parks, including Disneyland, now is considering a lawsuit against the state over its COVID lockdowns. Disney has had to lay off 28,000 employees due to the shutdown, including our next guest, who organized a rally calling for the park to reopen. Joining me now is former Disneyland employee Desi Diamani. Desi, thank you so much for being with us. Let's get to your rally in just a moment, but if you would, I'd love you to walk me through the last couple of months for you. As Disneyland was shut down, you were furloughed. What were those four, five months like? Well, the, it was only supposed to be a furlough for two weeks, and obviously it turned into what we're now in like seven. or eight months. So it was a lot of waiting, hoping. We kept getting email updates, and they said everything is fine. And then all of a sudden, the news article broke that 28,000 cast members were laid off. And one by one, we began to see, like, I began to see all of my friends posting notices that they were one of the ones. And I was hoping they would sweep me under the rug and skip me. But I was one of the 28,000 people that was laid off as well. Yeah, I saw that you, um, over a period of weeks, saw your friends see their furloughs turned into layoffs. Yours, Craig Mifferman, you got laid off about a month ago? Uh, three weeks ago on Friday, actually, officially. Yeah. And so yesterday you decided to hold a rally to get the government of California, to get Gavin Newsom to allow Disneyland to reopen. What made you decide to put a rally together? You know, I, I think it came to the point of seeing some of my friends that had been working with the company for 20, 30 years, um, getting getting their notices after they're just a number. And then um, my heart just kept breaking for them. I, I couldn't, all these people that have invested all of this time, and I know that Disney's been fighting behind the scenes trying to get uh, Gavin Newsom to open things up, and he has been really bullheaded and re kind of putting um, theme parks on the back burner. So I just got so frustrated and I said, I need to do something about it. And, I, and the friend of mine reached out to me and said, let's plan something and we plan the rally. Right, and I should correct myself, the rally was on the 17th. Um, let's yes. go over the, the restrictions that Gavin Newsom is putting on the opening of theme parks. And it's tied to what county your, your theme park is located in. Now, okay. Disneyland, your, your former employer, unfortunately now, um, is under mm -hmm. one of the most strict restrictions. I believe that California is requiring now the positivity rate to drop below 2%. Uh, for the county yes. and less than one new case per 100,000 residents. That's one 
per day One per 100,000 residents. I don't know, Desi, if Disneyland could ever accomplish something like that until the coronavirus is totally swept away Absolutely. And, and, and quashed. But yeah, even with the coronavirus and the vaccine, he's making the restrictions so intense. Like even when the vaccine is approved by the FDA, he's saying, well, California has to approve it by its own sciences. So when can that be? He keeps pushing the bar farther and farther back. And I think um, Disneyland already prides itself on its safe. Safety is the number one key at the Disneyland Resort. So they keep everybody safe. And I think that with all of the restrictions that he keeps setting in place, he's making it next to impossible for anybody to work. Right. It's next to impossible is the key you just said right there. I'll just really yeah. quickly, Desi, I, I, under these guidelines, it's hard to know if Disneyland would ever be able to reopen. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. It's it's extremely tragic. And the purpose of our rally was was to to raise a voice to hopefully have him see that there are human beings lives at stake. It's not just Disneyland, but it's the surrounding community at Disneyland that's been suffering because Disneyland isn't bringing tourism in from all over the world. Right. And right. I know people don't necessarily are people are afraid of the coronavirus um and so they're like well i don't know if right. we want people to come in but tourism gonna, is what has been keeping absolutely. orange county A alive lot. we gotta run desi we're up against time thank you for sharing what's going on there in california with us more fox and friends right after birth of the fox bet super six presidential debate game is min tran of georgia the husband and father of two girls won $50,000. I spoke to men about his reaction and his plans for the money. Listen. I just um, see on Facebook and the Fox Bet with the uh, Fox Bet Super Sick and I just download it and then, you know, play along with the having fun. And then here we go today. So I, I don't know. I'm excited to win that prize. 10% of my wild well win, I will donate to my Central Vietnam to uh, help out those people at they need it. That uh, now it's that a lot of people need over there it's flooding and hurricane come in. There's no working, so all my 10% is gonna be in Vietnam, and uh, I'm gonna buy for my uh, my daughter a uh, birthday gift on this weekend. Men won fifty thousand dollars. You can win some money too because the Fox Bet Super Six is giving away one million dollars of Terry Bradshaw's money today in the biggest contest in Super Six history. Download the Fox Bet Super Six app at the App Store or on Google Play. So men said he saw it on Fox News. He saw about the Fox Bet app. Mm -hmm. He went and answered the six questions. He won. And how cool. He's going to give away money to uh, natural disaster relief in his home country of Vietnam and, of course, the president for his daughter. And his daughter's going to get, get a great gift, yeah. uh, a little bigger than maybe was expected. Yeah. I just want to make sure Terry Bradshaw shows up and personally writes the check when I win it uh, later on. <laughs> I don't have luck like this. I don't know if you guys have ever won anything like this, but I'm that girl who goes to Atlantic City and loses every time. That's because your mentality. You have to go in. When I go to a casino. There you go. And Jedi, you know. Oh, this could be. On occasion. If you go in trying to protect yourself from losing and worrying about losing, you will. You go in ready to win, you're going to oh, win. I'm telling no, you, no. it's here. Uh, I take the uh, exact opposite approach. I go in saying I'm prepared to lose X amount of money, yeah, and I'm paying for the time to just yeah. enjoy losing that's that money. Right, yeah. <laughs> that's how I look at it. Well, it's always well, better. Pretty cool. <laughs> pretty ahead. cool for him. Yeah, yeah very cool for him. And it's always no, cooler it's to win. No, it's pretty cool for him. It's pretty awesome. Always cool to win somebody yes. else's money, and you can win <laughs> Terry Bradshaw's money right now on the Fox Bet Super <laughs> Absolutely, that's right. Straight ahead, thousands line up in New York for the first day of early voting in the city as over.